The following is a presentation of Chandler Christian Church in Chandler, Arizona. For more information, please go to chandlercc.org. About hell. A number of years ago, a lot of years ago now, when I was first uh, started the Pastor Chandler Christian Church, our campus was up at 800 West Galveston, much smaller church then, and, and uh, we had launched from a point of having one service and one Sunday school time to a service and then a Sunday school time and another service, and had grown. And behind our church, there was an alleyway, and between the services, during the Sunday school hour, there was a man back in the alleyway whose car had broken down, and uh, they had jack- he had jacked up the car and had crawled underneath the car to try to fix whatever was underneath it. I don't know what it was. I saw him out there. Others saw him out there and asked if he needed help, and he said, no, I got it taken care of. And so they went on to their adult Sunday school classes. And as the class was ending, the class time was ending, the jack that he had the car up on broke or gave way, and the car came down on top of him. And he began to yell for help, and immediately people began to respond. Some of you might even remember this. They began to respond. Well, a couple of our nurses ran out to see how he was, what he was doing and what the problem was, and a bunch of men ran out there. I said, and anyway, called 911, and, and uh, people were just in such a frenzy that someone ran in to call 911. This was before cell phones, because so you had to have a call with a wire. Anyway, some of you remember that. Anyway, and so somebody ran inside to call 911, and, uh, and a group of men went out to the car, and the nurses got down. One of the guys got down to check him out, and, and they felt it was safe to try to get the car off of him. So a bunch of the guys gathered around the car and lifted it up, literally lifted it up, and they carefully slid him out from underneath the car, and the nurses began to check him out, and then the EMTs came, and they checked him out and determined that he, he maybe had a broken bone, maybe just one, but other than a few abrasions, he was okay. He was safe from this. And everybody took a huge collective sigh of relief. And then we went on with our church services. But I I marveled at that because I thought to myself, how amazing that the entire church, when one person was in danger, maybe even to the point of death, how the entire church mobilized into action to rescue that one person from danger or death. In April of this year, Time Magazine had at its cover an article talking about hell. It was prompted because uh, Rob Bell, who is now the former pastor of Mars Hill Church in Michigan, wrote a book called Love Wins, a book about heaven, hell, and the fate of every person who has ever lived. And in that book, contrary to uh, standard evangelical theology, uh, this book sparked much controversy because he questions the reality of hell. Is there really a hell? Franklin Graham, Billy Graham's son, called his book and his writing heresy. But I want to give him some props because the reality is that for a long time we've not been discussing this issue. And I will tell you that him writing this book has caused us to step forward and begin to talk about this issue about hell, and I think it's important for us to do. Now, you see, the reason we don't talk about it is because hell is not a very popular subject. Um, It really isn't. In fact, of surveys of preachers, uh, what topics will you not want to preach on? Number one was the topic hell. People don't want to talk about hell because people don't really want to think about hell. In fact, the reality is we love to talk about heaven. Last weekend, we talked about heaven. Everybody likes to think about the sweet by and by and streets of gold, and everybody likes to talk about heaven. If you ask people what book of the Bible would they like to study, they say, Revelation. Why? Because they think Revelation talks about heaven, but when you read it, it actually addresses the subject of hell more than it addresses the subject of heaven. According to research in America, 81% of Americans believe in life after death. That's pretty strong, 81%. And 76% of Americans believe in heaven. They believe that heaven is a literal place, the majority of them. Some say they think it's just symbolic or a state of mind, but the majority, vast majority, believe it's a literal place. 59% of Americans believe in hell. That's a high percentage. 40% of those who said they believe in hell believe that it's literal. It's literally a place. 30% said they believe it's a place of eternal torment. Only 10% of those who believe in hell thought it was just symbolic or maybe hell is what we're going through here on earth. According to surveys, 64% of Americans believe that they will go to heaven. Vast majority. Will you go to heaven if you die? If there is a heaven, yes, I believe I'll go there. of Americans think that people who go to heaven or hell will do so depending on their actions on earth. In other words, if I'm good enough, I'll go to heaven, and if I'm not good enough, I'll go to hell. 
And that's what most people believe, that your salvation is based upon what you do here on this earth, the actions that you do. But what really surprised me in these surveys is that only 4% of Americans think they are going to hell. Only 4%. Which brings me to summarize that most of us believe in hell. We just don't think anybody goes there. And we believe in the reality of it. We just don't want to think about somebody we know or somebody we love or somebody that we have a relationship with. We don't want to think that, any, that, that maybe we might even go there. We don't want to think that anyone goes there. And this fits our sense of tolerance. I mean, after all, um, a, a good God wouldn't send anyone to hell, would he? I mean, would a good God send anybody to hell? Or is, isn't eternity in hell over punishment? I mean, let's face it, we do all make mistakes here, but isn't eternity in hell, isn't that just like punishing a little too much? And, and after all, hell, it's just mean. And God isn't mean, is he? Well, in a very real sense, God doesn't send anyone to hell. He really doesn't send anyone to hell. The only ones going to hell are the ones who have chosen to reject God's truth and his redemptive plan. And instead, they've chosen their own eternal destiny. God doesn't send anyone to hell. By our choices, by our decisions, we determine our eternal destiny. And so in a very real sense, God doesn't send us to hell. We send ourselves there. In Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 19, the apostle says this, The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness, since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. In other words, God has been revealed to people down through the centuries. You can't look up at the sky and see the same stars in rotation year after year after year after year and think, wow, boo, that just must have happened. I mean, we modern man do because we want to deny God. But if you look at it with truth in your eyes, you have to sense that. Or you look at plant life and you look at the reproduction process and you go, wow, could that have just happened? And logic and reason says, no. There has to be an intelligent designer. And because of that, God has been revealed to people, but people don't want to believe it. They don't want the truth. They suppress the truth so they can choose to live the way they want to live. Paul says in Romans chapter 1, verse 21, For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor thank, gave thanks to him, but in their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man, dead presidents, and, and birds and animals and reptiles, diamondbacks and cardinals. <laughs> Therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their heart. It's man's choice. See, God made us in his own image. And because he made us in his own image, he gave us free will. He gave us the ability to choose him or not choose him. Otherwise, we had no choice. There would be no free will, and we really wouldn't worship God. So he gave us the ability to make free choice. And when he did so, we said, hmm, worship and follow you or worship and follow me. And we made our choice. And thus, we made our choice of eternal destiny. You see, hell is only for beings and people who reject God and his son, Jesus Christ. And God gave us the option, and we made our choice. The great C.S. Lewis wrote in his book, The Great Divorce, this line. I love this. People will either say to God, thy will be done. Or God will say to people, thy will be done. You see, God is both loving and just. He demonstrates his love to us over and over again. But if we refuse and reject that love, God is also just. And heaven and hell are a result of his love and his justice. 
Let me see if I can illustrate that for you. I asked some volunteers um, uh, to help me out with this. So volunteers, could you come up here uh, for a moment? I need your help. So hurry up here on the stage, please, my volunteers. Uh, Hustle, hustle, hustle. Okay. Would you welcome these volunteers as they come? Because they have no idea what they're up here to do. All right? So uh, what I need you to do, if you don't mind, is to slip that on over your shirt, okay? I need you to slip that on over your shirt. And uh, you can, okay, all right, you take your jacket off. Here, I'll take that. Slip that on uh, over your shirt. And um, what, these, uh, what these T-shirts represent uh, are your lives, okay? And um, uh, I, what I need you to do in just a minute is I want you to hold them out, okay? And so, um, and everybody goes into this world, comes into this world pure without sin. There's no problems, But the problem is, that's all right, don't worry about it. It's not a fashion statement, okay. All right, so um, everyone comes into this world without sin. uh, They're pure and simple. But at some point in their time, they choose their way they're going to live their lives. And so I need to ask you a question, but you don't have to answer. You just shake your head. Um, Let me ask you, hold your shirt out if you would, please, because I don't want to mark on your blouse. Um, Has there ever been a time in your life when you've chosen to do your will over God's will. Now, hang on. I know that you're a lovely young lady, and you probably have never done much sin in your entire life, but has there ever been a time in your life when maybe, maybe you told a little fib, or maybe you did something that was a little bit wrong, and, and uh, in choosing to serve yourself or serve God, you chose to serve yourself or God? Has that ever happened to you? All right, so let's just say that um, she has a sin in her life, all right? Come on up here. All right, so uh, just hold out your T-shirt. I'm not even going to ask you the question, all right? I'm just going just gonna to go over here just to make it very plain. Good enough? Turn yeah, turn around. That might be a good idea. Yeah, that could work. Okay. Now, <clears throat> I know that you're a wonderful person, and I know your husband, and he wouldn't marry if you weren't a lovely, wonderful person. But I'm sure even in your life you've made some choices uh, to do something outside of God's plan and to live your own life and, and to live in rejection to him. Would I be correct in saying that? All right, so uh, I'm going to have to give you a mark or two as well. All right, now here's the problem. God, who is pure and holy and without sin, looks at sinners and said, I would love to take you into heaven, but I can't. Because nothing impure can ever come into heaven. Nothing impure can ever be in my presence for all of eternity. And it's not because I'm forcing you into hell. It's because you have made choices to serve yourself rather than serve me. And so when God looks at these people and sees the marks, whether it's just one or, well, uh, you know, or just a couple, God looks at us and says, you've chosen poorly. And thus I cannot take you into heaven. And so, which one of these people would God bring into heaven? Well, the answer is, not a chance. The answer is, I'm sorry, you're a really good person, but no. And the, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. She accepted Christ as her Savior. And because she accepted Christ as her Savior, God's a significant gift of love. He took her sins away, washed clean and and trounced them into the ground in Satan when he killed him. And so now without sin, she stands pure, not because of what she has done, but because of God's love. God's love and God's justice. Does that make sense to you? All right, give them a hand, would you? Thank you. You can keep your lovely t-shirts as a parting gift, okay? And so the reality is every one of us choose our own eternal destiny. I mean, God doesn't send anybody to hell. We do by our own choices. But you say, well, wait a minute. Isn't, isn't eternity spent in hell unjust punishment for just a few decades of sin? I mean, okay, we sin, but we don't sin that long. And, and isn't an eternity in hell just really too long for just a, a little time of sin? And some would say so. 
There are even some good Bible teachers that would question this. There are some who believe that the judgment in hell will be varied and the torment in hell will be varied. It's a little bit like the kids game, and you know, where you say, uh, you know, you search for something and you say, oh, you're cold, you're cold. Oh, you're getting warmer. Oh, you're on fire, you know. Well, it's kind of like God will sometimes send people to hell and some will just be in the tepid hell and others will be in the really hot hell, you know. There are some Bible teachers who believe that. There are also some who believe that hell is temporary, that uh, depending upon the degree of our sin, that God will let you be in torment for a while and then eventually he will annihilate you or he will, he will remove you uh, from the, the, the torment of hell and from life totally. And so the question I say is, what, what does the Bible say about this topic? And so I dive into the Old Testament, and I find verses like Daniel chapter 12, verse 2, that says, multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth, that is, they're dead, the multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake some to what kind of life? Everlasting life, and others will uh, to shame and to what? Everlasting contempt. Now, we all want everlasting life in heaven, right? You know, so why is it so hard for us to think of everlasting death or contempt? So I said, well, what does Jesus say about this? And I turned to Matthew 25, verse 46, and discovered that he says, and then they will go away to what kind of punishment? Eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. We like that part. We just struggle with the other. And so I said, well, ultimately, let's go to Revelation, see what it says in Revelation. In Revelation chapter 14, verse 11, the Bible says, and the smoke of their torment rises How long? And ever. You say, well, but but isn't hell mean? I mean, God isn't mean, is he? Well, fact of the matter is that hell is mean. There's no two ways around it. And hell was created for mean people. Hell was created for Satan and his angels, those who rebelled against God. And they are mean people. But that doesn't mean that God is mean. In fact, Jesus suffered and died for mean people. He he gave his heart, he gave his life for mean people. In Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 9, the Bible says, At just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for mean people. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though some might, a good man, some might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still mean, Christ died for us. Since we now have been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? Folks, listen, hell is mean, and it's for mean people, but a God who will suffer and die for mean people so that they can be saved. He's not mean. He's amazingly loving. And so hell is for mean people, those who reject God. But God isn't mean because God did everything within his possibility to rescue and redeem mankind when he himself came to earth to die to pay the price for our sin. That's not mean. That's love. Well, okay, but do people who have never heard of Jesus go to hell? I mean, what about people who have never, ever heard? Or maybe those who have heard and that, that we just hope will go to heaven. Do people who have never heard of Jesus or ignored Jesus, will they go to hell? Well, again, I defer to Jesus' statement on this subject. And in John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus answered and said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Read with me. No one comes to the Father except through me. That sounds pretty inclusive, doesn't it? You say, well, okay, well, Jesus said that, but is, is that really what was taught in the church? Well, I go into the book of Acts, and just a few pages in, as the church and the salvation and the theology is being formed and expressed into the people's lives, in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, The apostle Peter preaches and says, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. No other name. No other name. You say, well, well, what if they've never had a chance to hear? 
Well, there was a guy by the name of Abraham. Do you remember him as we read through the story? Who was just seeking after God, and God spoke to him and gave him a message so that Abraham trusted in God's revelation to him. And the Bible says because he trusted in God, God considered that faith as righteousness, being in right standing with God. So when a person begins to seek God, God will speak to them. He will direct their hearts. When Paul, or Saul as we call him, was raging against the church on his way up to Damascus to persecute the Christians, the Bible tells us that Jesus spoke to him in a vision, knocked him off his donkey, and communicated with him so that he would come to know Christ and follow him. If you seek him, the Bible says, you will be found by him. God spoke to Cornelius in Acts chapter 10 in a vision. He was a God-fearing man. And God said to him, go send somebody down to Joppa to get Peter and bring Peter back so that you can hear the good news about Jesus. And he did. And he and his entire household were saved. God even sent an angel to speak to a donkey so that the donkey could speak to his owner, Balaam. And my contention is if God can speak to a donkey, then God can speak to anybody. The fact is that if a person is seeking God, he will be there for them. And and there are records after records after records of people in the Middle East and people in Africa and people in India and and people uh, in all over the world who have begun to seek something more than what their world offered them. And God revealed himself to them in a vision. God revealed himself to them in a dream. In fact, most Muslim converts come to Christ because they see a vision of Jesus and begin to seek him and find the truth. And the truth sets them free because there is no other name. He is the way, the truth, and the life. The question isn't, will God speak? The question is, will man respond? Will man respond? Pastor Brian Jones um, he's a pastor of Christ Church in the uh, in Philadelphia area. And uh, he writes of his journey, having gone to Bible college and then to seminary. Uh, at some point in time, he was challenged by his seminary professors to question the reality of hell. And so he bought into it. And he wrote this book called Hell is Real, But I Hate to Admit It. In fact, we have this in our resource center. You might want to pick it up. It's a great book. But he describes his journey. And he said at one point in his own quiet time, he was challenged to think about the reality of hell, and this is what he writes. He said, I had always assumed that the Bible contained very few scattered references to hell. I was wrong. Hell is taught everywhere. Take the book of Matthew, for instance, just one book among 27 in the entire New Testament, and here's what we learn about hell from that book alone. Twelve separate passages record Jesus' teaching about the judgment of nonbelievers and their assignment to eternal punishment. Matthew 13, 49 through 50 summarizes them all. This is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus employed the most graphic language to describe what hell is like. Fire. Eternal fire. Destruction. Away from his presence thrown outside, blazing furnace, darkness, eternal punishment, weeping and gnashing of teeth. As I moved from the Gospels into the the rest of the New Testament, I was struck by how the writers unashamedly addressed the issue. There is no hesitancy or apology in their words. The basic tone is, This is reality. Now let's get out there and tell people how to avoid it. And he's right. The New Testament is filled with passages. Jesus spoke about hell almost twice as much as he talked about heaven. Every book of the New Testament describes and gives information regarding the eternal punishment of hell. Jesus tells this amazing story in Luke chapter 16. 
And some say that this story is a parable, although even though it, it sounds like a parable, Jesus never described it as a parable. There are many places where it says, and he taught them this parable, but this one isn't described as a parable. In fact, this is the only one of these type of stories where Jesus actually uses the name of an individual. Never in a parable does he ever do that. And so many question whether is this a parable or is this a glimpse into eternity? You know this story. In Luke chapter 16, beginning in verse 19, the Bible says, there was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. Not a pretty picture. In America, we would call the rich man successful, self-made man. But we would also diss him because we would say he doesn't care for the poor. But the reality is we don't know anything about these circumstances. Lazarus may have wasted all of his money on wine, women, and song. We don't know. And the rich man may have earned his money a good way, a positive way. And and did he have compassion? We just don't know exactly at this point in time. In fact, we don't have enough information for a moral judgment. And we don't know their spiritual situation. Well, beginning in verse 22 of Luke 16, the Bible says, The time came when the beggar died, and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. That was the time of Jesus in the Old Testament period. That was the picture of heaven being placed in Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried in hell where he was in, what? Torment. He looked up and he saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called him and said, Father Abraham, have pity on me. Send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger into the water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. Now there's a couple of pictures there. Torment, which means to be at the very bottom. Agony, which is to be in extreme pain. Fire, which is incredibly painful. And the Bible doesn't say that it ever burns itself out. It's unquenchable fire. And notice that in the story, as Jesus tells it, that that the rich man can see into heaven, but Lazarus cannot see into hell. Think of that torment. Well, in verse 25, Abraham replied and said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. It's an eternal, impassable divide. So the rich man Answers in verse 27, it says, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. And Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. They've got the Bible. They've got the word of God. Let them read and understand. No, Father Abraham, the rich man said, if someone would come from the dead and goes to them, then they will repent. And Abraham said to the rich man, if they don't listen to Moses and the prophets, the word of God, then they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. Little picture there. It's a sad story. Wealth doesn't say And once that decision is made and death comes, there is no turning back. There are no options. The writer of Hebrews says this in 10 verse 29. How much more severely do you think a man deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot and has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified him and who has insulted the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, it is mine to avenge, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. Read the last line with me. It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. 
Now, I want to give you a warning here. Knowing about hell will exact a huge price. Warning. Knowing about hell will exact a huge price on your soul. You see, knowing about hell, you will never look at an unsaved person the same way again. That person who works with you in the cubicle that you see every day, maybe you ride to work with. That neighbor who lives and that, the really good people down the street, the, the person of Islam or, or the Buddhist or uh, the guy that you know at work who's in Hindu or, or, or just the, the, the friend that you have club meetings with or you sit with during the soccer games and don't know Jesus, you'll never be able to look at them the same again if you understand hell. They may be your good friends. They may be good people. They may be better people than you. Moral, upstanding, honest, hardworking, intelligent individuals, your friends, your family. But hear me. Without Jesus, they are going to hell. That 2,000-pound car with the jack underneath it is going to give way at some point in time. At some point in time in their life, it's going to fall and kill them. Unless they come to know Christ as Savior. Warning. No one about hell will exact a huge price on your soul. Because you can never look at an unsaved person the same way again. And it will exact a huge price because you will be ridiculed. You will be ridiculed. If you believe this and begin to talk to people about it, you will be ridiculed. You mean you think I'm going to hell? (laughs) What gives you the right to say that? Who do you think you are? You think you're a better person than I am? You think you know what I don't know? Who are you to say that you think that I might be going to hell? Who gives you? You're just one of those judgmental Christians. Oh, the world would be better without you people. Who do you think you are? And you may lose some friends over this. Once you understand about hell, you may be ridiculed and it may cost you some friends. It may cost you some relationships. But what kind of a friend would you be if you let them live underneath the car with the shaky jack and not give them any warning whatsoever? In 1857, in a guard room in the ruins of uh, the fortress in Palatine Hill in Rome, there was an etching that was discovered. It's called the Alex Aminos Graffito. It was from the third century, just about 200 years after Jesus, when Christianity was still illegal but was beginning to thrive in the Roman Empire. And in this image, and you see it on your left as it's etched into the wall by knife point probably, and then you see a marking of it or a sketch of it that was a pencil marking. And in the image, you'll see that there is a man standing with a hand raised as if to praise a being, worship. And what he is praising is a figure who is on a cross. But the head of that person on the cross is a donkey's head. Now, we don't know all the details. We don't have anything other than this image. But underneath it, it says, Ale Eximos Sebete Theon in the Latin, which literally translated means Alex Minos worships his God. And reading between the lines, the image details that Alex Minos, who was a believer and a follower of Christ, perhaps spoke to his friends about the need for salvation, about the need of the fact that they don't know Jesus, that they have eternal damnation in their future. And so they mocked him. They ridiculed him. And for 1,700 years, 
their ridicule has stood on the wall. Alex Aminos worships his God. Knowing about hell will exact a huge price. You'll be ridiculed. But knowing about hell will make you appreciate Jesus as never before. That in your condition, you had no hope of eternal salvation until Jesus came. In his love, God saved the world through him. And if we will accept him, then he will take our sin away and wash us clean in his blood so that heaven can be ours. Paul says in Colossians 1.13, For he has rescued us from the damnation of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son that he loves. Not a very pleasant subject. Why couldn't I have preached on heaven and Kenny preached on hell? But folks, listen, it's a subject we need to know and understand. Jeff Streit, who's a pastor friend of mine, who preaches at a church in Lafayette, Indiana, said he was teaching a high school group of students one day, and he opened it up for questions. Anybody have any questions? And the kids started peppering him with different questions. And there was a girl in the back who was visiting. He'd never seen her before. She came with a guest, and she didn't say anything. She was very quiet. And until the end of the session, he said, anybody else have any questions? And she raised her hand. And he said, what's your question? And she said, well, the Bible says that God loves everybody, but it also says that he sends people to hell. How can a loving God send people to hell? So Jeff said he began to discuss with her much of what we've talked about here today, some of the same principles. But she began to argue back with him. And he said it was late in the day, and he was tired, and uh, his emotions got the best of him. And he began to argue back with her. And it got a little heated, he said, and, and finally realized what's happening. He said, you know, we'll need to talk about that later. Are there any other questions? They dealt with a couple more, and he dismissed the group. But he caught up with the girl as she was walking out the door. And he said, I have to apologize for you. He said, it got a little tense in there. I didn't mean for it to get tense. And he said, can I share with you something? And she said, sure. So they sat down on the steps in front of where they were meeting, and he opened up his Bible, and he shared with her God's plan for redeeming mankind. That man was lost in sin. And God in his divine love sent his son Jesus. And if we will receive him and believe in him, that we receive eternal life. And he said she began to cry. And she said, that's what I want more than anything else. And in that discussion, the story came out that she, a high school senior, had been having an affair for the last year with one of the neighbors who lived near her, a married man. And she had been carrying this guilt in her heart. And the reason she was so terrified and wouldn't want to believe in hell is because she thought she was going to go there. And rather than face her present guilt, she just decided to deny her future judgment and punishment. And that's when she accepted Jesus. Maybe in this room this morning, there's someone who you've heard this and you're going, I I don't know. I don't want to believe it because I think I may go there. You don't have to. That's why Jesus died on the cross. And if you've never accepted him as Savior and Lord, if you've never given your heart to him, then the Bible says where eternally you will be. But it gives you the option of Jesus who will take your sin away. That's your choice. You made a wrong one. Make a right one and accept Christ as Savior. And for those of us who have made that decision, how can we sit on our hands when there are 2,000-pound cars hanging over the heads of our friends? How can we just ignore that? How can we as a church ignore that? But that's your decision. What will you decide?